Welcome to the Think and Grow Well Show. If you allow your doctor, your insurance, or your Uncle Sam to define healthy, or you blame someone else for the way you feel, or you seek the fountain of youth in a prescription bottle, at a needle tip, or along the scalpel's edge, then be advised, you are about to be offended. You should probably leave now. Anybody can just think and feel better? That's scary. I mean, thoughts aren't regulated by the feds, and no drug company has a patent on them. So thinking thoughts must not be very safe or effective. If you love feeling frisky and having fun, take responsibility for your own vitality and want freedom to enjoy epic experiences with folks you love, welcome aboard and prepare to be blown away. The Think and Grow Well Show starts now. Here's your host, Dr. Lori Barr. Welcome to this episode of Think and Grow Well, the podcast for you guys who are out there looking to build full vitality and live life full out, fun and frisky until you die. I'm so excited. My special guest today is Dr. Ted Corin. And Dr. Ted is a chiropractic physician who grew up in Brooklyn, survived the public school system there, which I'm sure he has some uh, uh, interesting stories about. He then graduated from Miami in Florida And he got a BA in media and communications. Then he went to chiropractic college at Sherman College of Chiropractic, was prolific as a writer, even in school, was the valedictorian of his class, got out and started practicing, co-founded a chiropractic school, started practicing and started publishing like mad. He is the most widely read chiropractor in the world. His publications are everywhere, they're in multiple languages, and he has probably affected more people uh, with ideas of how they can feel better using chiropractic than anyone out there. So it is my special privilege to have him talking with us today. So happy you're here, Dr. Corin. Thank you, Lori, and thank you for inviting me, Dr. Barr. <laughs> so, um, Let's just start off with some basics. What drew you to chiropractic as the best field for you to personally help individuals feel their best? I I wasn't supposed to go to chiropractic school. I was supposed to go to medical school. And uh, in fact, two of my younger brothers are are MDs. But uh, I made a weird turn somewhere. And uh, maybe it was that I didn't like the sight of blood. I I don't know. (laughs) But uh, I was attracted to the philosophy of healing. Uh, chiropractic has a very powerful healing philosophy that's thousands of years old and I felt that this had more to offer humanity and was more consistent with the way I felt about health and healing and uh, that's why I started uh, in chiropractic school Uh, my younger brothers continued to go to medical school and whenever they we get together they always want me to take care of them because people usually ask uh, do you guys fight and I say no we don't fight at all their patients and uh, we usually agree on most issues. It's, you know, when people sit down uh, and talk about things logically and rationally uh, with understanding and compassion, they have tremendous amounts in common because we really all want to do what you said, to keep people alive and healthy and happy for their whole lives. And we're all searching for those secret ways of healing. And I feel like I found one in my work. Yeah, it sounds like it, and it's so nice. I was going to ask you how the interaction was with your brothers, and it's so nice to hear that they're open to hearing more than just what they learned in medical school about health and healing. You know, they don't just think about fixing flat tires. They're open to what chiropractic and other alternative forms of healing bring to the table. Uh, That's so important as healthcare evolves in this country and patients become more aware of how they are in charge of their health. Uh, they should be demanding that of their doctors. So it's awesome that your brothers recognize your expertise and, and let you apply that to them as you, they are your patients. Well, that's happening more and more because, uh, you know, there was an Eisenberg study. It must have come out about 20 years ago, which shocked everybody, found out that over half of all Americans 
went to natural healers, alternative healers, complementary healers, well over half. Uh, and most of them didn't tell their MDs because they felt that the MDs would be critical and, uh, you know, consenting toward them. But uh, that really opened up people's eyes. And then he came out with a study a little after that, which showed that it was even greater. The numbers were increasing at a great rate. And MDs are now starting to listen. And I think some of it uh, is because they, they know that the, the diseases of civilization are increasing and medicine really has problems in relating to them. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, um, you know, depression, uh, all these diseases of civilization, as we call it, uh, which, believe it or not, barely existed 100, 200 years ago. People are not aware that cancer is a relatively new disease. Yes, it was been, has been in the literature in the past, but it was very rare. Heart disease was rare. Um, it's rather fascinating reading some old books by medical doctors that when people were told in the early 1900s, uh, well, they would say to, to their advisor, I'm thinking of going into cardiology. The answer was always, don't do it, you'll make no money. Nobody's getting heart attacks. There's, heart disease is so rare. Why would you bother? And that was not that long ago. You're right. You're and right. we could say the same thing about modern diseases of, of children. You know, autism, allergies, ADD, ADHD. And that's just the A's. Suddenly, they have, we have diseases that barely existed years ago and then are now, are sadly to say, epidemic. So people are saying, what's going on? We've had all this regular medicine and the kids are sicker than ever, and cancer is increasing, and it's not just a matter of managing illness. So much of medicine today is managing illness, keeping right. people uh, comfortable. And usually it's polypharmacy, multiple drugs. And you see, uh, I'm sure, you know, you work with pediatrics, but I'm sure you talk to many MDs that see a wide range of the public, and especially people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and older are on multiple medications. Yes often from different doctors yes and nobody yes. really knows what's getting who's getting what and the side effects come up so they're given drugs for the side effects which then interact with the other drugs they're given polypharmacy is is a serious problem today so a lot of people are starting to turn away from the, the over medication of their lives and look at what are, are really traditional ways of living when people were much healthier and uh, of course you're gonna run into uh, what do they call it uh, Roadblocks, you know, uh, people will criticize you for looking at things differently, uh, and that's to be understood. The history of medicine, uh, unfortunately, full of people that had wonderful ideas but were attacked and sometimes destroyed. Um, remember the story of Semmelweis? Yes. You know that's famous. He discovered why women died in childbirth from infection because the, the doctors, that the gynecologists and pedi uh, obstetricians that were delivering babies, were, that, that before they would deliver the babies, they would be in school teaching, uh, doing dissection with their hands in the guts of bo dead bodies, cadavers. And they would wipe their hands on a towel, no sterilization, and then deliver a baby. And the death rate among mothers was horrendous. Yes. Um, and people, in fact, people would search out midwives because they knew going to a hospital to deliver a baby was often a death sentence. So this one guy, Dr. Semmelweis, I forget who he was inspired by, maybe Lister or others from that period, uh, said, wait a minute, uh, I'm head of pediatrics now, I'm a head of, head of uh, obstetrics in this hospital, everybody has to wash their hands in bleach or something like that. Uh, I forget, it was, but it was strong stuff. And the doctors were upset so much because the implication was they were causing disease. And yes. that was unheard of. How dare you say that we doctors are making our patients sick or killing them? And Semmelweis said, just wash your hands. Don't give me any stuff. <laughs> Don't give me any lip. Just wash your hands. And when he did that, the death rate went down 99%. And as a result, he was thrown out of the hospital. Not only was he thrown out of the hospital, he was thrown out of the whole medical society he ended up dying. He lost his wife as a result, and he ended up dying in an insane asylum. That's, yes. the, that's the gift he got back from medicine for discovering that there were invisible organisms that we couldn't see yet that were actually causing disease and death. And people like Semmelweis are around today. Yes. 
Uh, and it was not long ago that uh, we had a Dr. Gerson who developed a way of curing cancer that worked. And the Gerson therapies were hounded out of the U.S. and are now in Mexico. Even though the success rate was incredible, uh, some people do survive. I've been reading Dr. Issels, Joseph Issels, from, who used to be in Hamburg, I believe. He uh, also, he would get the cases of cancer that failed chemo and radiation and surgery. People that were on death's door, and many times he would get them better. And he said, the reason why we get them better is because we detoxify them yes, and yes. cleanse them because cancer is a disease of toxicity, of poison. And he said there's two kinds, from the outside environment and from internal your own body. So he would give people cleansing diets, but he would also make sure all their dead teeth were taken out. And he said he'd never seen a case of, a case of cancer that didn't have between two and ten dead teeth. Amazing. Now, so, he was thrown in prison. Not many people know that. No, I didn't know that. BBC did a, a whole expose on him. He became a cause celebre, and he was released from prison. And to the shock of everybody, the government put him in charge of cancer research. So here he was in charge of the people that had him thrown in prison. Wow. And as a result, Germany is now it's one of the meccas of cancer research yes. for people that want alternatives and natural ways. If only America could be the same. Yes. And so so let's get back let's get back to what the individual can do. So in your opinion, what is the major stumbling block that keeps people from living to their full physical potential? What's the one thing that keeps them stuck? Well, ignorance. Ignorance on how to eat, ignorance on, on uh, what they're taking and doing. Um, you know, it's amazing how, uh, you know, I got, I really didn't know much about anything when I started school. I was a blank slate. And when I graduated chiropractic school, I wasn't much better. But I had a philosophy that was pointing me in a way that the natural way is best. And if there's a new disease, well, let's find out what's causing it. Because if it's new, something new must be causing it. So that's why I started exploring uh, cancer. Uh, there was tragedy in my family, which led me to it. And I realized, oh my God, there wasn't cancer years ago. What is different? And a lot of it are the toxins in our environment um, and uh, toxins in our food. Um, what I tell people to do is eat like your grandparents ate. If the food wasn't around when your grandparents weren't there, don't touch it. Don't touch margarine. Don't touch, uh, you know, the trans fats. Don't eat these butter spreads. Eat butter, real butter. If you have Amish near you or farmers, go to the farm and get non-pasteurized, non-homogenized milk. Get grass-fed beef. Stay away from anything that's been genetically modified. Stay away from bizarre oils like canola and vegetable oil. Wesson should be illegal. Uh, just eat the way your grandparents ate. They used fats. They cooked with fats. That's where they got their oils. And they are finding people that have the most fat in their diet are the thinnest. Yes. And they're the most active and they're the healthiest. Whenever I see people on low-fat diets, I just roll my eyes and think, well, they're paying more for food that tastes less, less good, good. Mm -hmm. and which is damaging their health. And of course, we're, uh, I know in many ways you, you attract a very good clientele, so I'm probably preaching to the convertible, preaching to the choir. Um, but you'd be amazed. I'll go to professional conventions where I think people know what health is, and they're drinking diet soda full of aspartame. And I go, oh my God, why are you doing that? Well, I don't say that. I don't want to start a fight, but I lecture on the subject. Yes. Uh, if it wasn't around when your grandparents weren't around, don't have it. Uh, you know, I go to the Amish because I'm in Pennsylvania, and they have homemade root beer and birch beer and ginger ale, and they don't drink beer. Uh, so if you want really good quality beer, you have to go to those microbreweries. Um, but uh, they, there is, you know, you have, I'm sure where you are or many of our, the people uh, listening to this are, there's great places all around. There's farms probably within an hour's drive. Yes. God, take care of your family. One day in a hospital could be a year's worth of good food. Well, not only that, yes, I mean, for, so you've got the expense of being in the hospital for one day, plus the risk of getting exposed to worse pathogens than out in the normal environment. So if you're not prepared when you enter that hospital environment, if you're not, if your baseline nutrition is not 
ample, you know, with good nutrients, and if you aren't exercising your body, your chances of surviving that healthcare encounter as an inpatient are decreased. Oh, absolutely. The hospitals, a gram negative bacteremia has killed well over 100,000 people a year in hospitals. Yes. In fact, they didn't have before they went to the hospital. Exactly. So the whole goal is to stay out of the hospital. Absolutely. Be healthy. <laughs> with the hospital. And if you go in there, uh, Robert Mendelssohn, who was a medical doctor, a pediatrician, I always loved his books. And he said, treat a hospital like a war. Do everything you can to stay out of it. But if you get in, get out as fast as you, you can. can. That's great so, advice. Great yeah, advice. It's good. Robert Mendelssohn wrote some really wonderful books. One was, which I used with my kids, was How to Raise a Healthy Child in Spite of Your Doctor. And <laughs> He was a famous pediatrician in the Chicago area, and he was beloved by his students because he taught in the medical schools. And later, when he started writing and criticizing much medical care as being unnecessary, in fact, one of his big arguments was, one, he's, he would say one grandmother is worth two pediatricians. Oh, totally. And his argument was, medicine destroys family history and structure. Hmm. He says, when you have tight, cohesive families, you have less medicine. He says, now in this world of people moving around and broken up families and nobody living together, it's really a tragedy. Yes. Uh, no more extended families. So that's when medicine flourishes. They forget their family traditions. I'm sure our grandparents knew a lot more about keeping people healthy than a lot of pediatricians do today. Yes. And because they forget the natural, safe, gentle ways of doing things. So when I was, uh, I was in practice a while, and I had a bad accident, and uh, I couldn't, I was disabled, I was knocked unconscious, and when I got up, that's when my problems started. Uh, I couldn't use my hands, they were in constant pain, I couldn't make a fist, I couldn't open them, uh, they were fat all the time, like sausage links. Goodness. Uh, my head, my neck, I was in pain all the time, plus I had sciatica, some days I couldn't walk. And uh, I actually gave up my license to practice. For the next 10 years, I traveled around the country seeking out healers who could help me. Many of them were chiropractors, majority, but I went to osteopaths, MDs, acupuncturists, physical therapists, body workers of all kinds, cranial sacral, wonderful people, absolutely wonderful, dedicated people, and I was getting worse. And this is 10 years. And then one day I discovered, I, I had no choice, I had to figure this out. And instead of sitting around feeling sorry for myself, I decided to start using my knowledge to figure out how to get myself better. And I chanced upon, or, or was lucky, or there was a coincidence, though my wife says there's no coincidences, and I was able to figure out a way to work on myself, found exactly where the problem was, and my 10 years of suffering cleared up in five days. Wow. And uh, my second patient, I was my first patient, my second patient was my wife who had migraines for 12 years since mm -hmm. our son was born, and nobody could help her. She wound up taking painkillers, you know, throwing up, being in a dark room. It was pretty bad. Uh, I found out exactly what the problem was. It took less than a second to correct it, mm -hmm. and her migraines have never come back. Wow. That was uh, probably about 13, 14 years ago. So I started traveling around the country working on people who I felt were the worst patients in the world. And who would be the worst patients? Doctors who went to everybody that and were still a mess. And I would, because I was lecturing and teaching, and I'd say, anybody still sick after years, you're still suffering, you've seen lots of doctors, see me during the break, I think I discovered something. Because I wanted to know whether this was valuable or just another thing, you know, that, you know, oh, sure, there's this thing and that thing. I wanted to know if this was truly unique, if it could help people where others had failed. And so uh, I started getting, I usually thought one or two doctors would stop by when I make that announcement, but the line went out the door. Goodness. Oh, everybody. Doctors were whispering to me, some days I'm sicker than my patients. Oh. Say, so, yeah, I know, I, I was shocked. And the results were so powerful, people started asking me, please help, please teach this. But I said I didn't know enough yet. And about 18 months later, I decided it was time. So now I teach corn-specific technique, which is really ancient healing with, a, um, I guess you'd say, a modern twist to it. Um, and uh, we've taught about 3,000 people, mostly professionals, uh, people from, 
professionals from every profession, but also I would lay people because you're permitted, to, you can work on yourself with this. And there's no law against working on yourself. That's right. Not yet. Exactly. Um, Robert Mendelssohn, who I like to quote, once said, if there was a law against people taking care of each other, then every time a mother gave a child an aspirin, she could be thrown in jail for practicing medicine without a license. Uh, thankfully, we still have that freedom of practice. And w when we talk about history, it's fascinating. Because I like history, and I've studied medical history. In the 19, I'm sorry, the 1820s and 1830s, because of the excesses of, of medicine at that time, all of the licensing laws in America were overturned. They got rid of all the medical licensing laws, hmm. except New Jersey, which I don't understand why, well, maybe because of the toxic waste in New Jersey. But all the licensing laws were gotten rid of. You could then, anyone could practice. Hmm. anything they wanted. Interesting. That, that lasted from about 1820 or 30 to almost 1900 and the licensing laws came back in full effect. But within that period America showed more improvements in health than any other country in the world. Hmm. In mortality dropped, uh, life expectancy increased, people were healthier and stronger and we had a flourishing of natural healing. Uh, schools, which is when osteopathy came up, mm -hmm. chiropractic, uh, eclectic schools, something called Thompsonism uh, by a guy named Graham, uh, which was very nutritional. Uh, he still survives by the name of Graham Crackers. <laughs> okay. Uh, history is fascinating, and we still have little bits. But America was far healthier when we had freedom of health care. And um, now that's why I, I think licensing laws were designed to protect the professions, not the public. And that's why I permit patients as well as professionals to come learn my work. You know, one thing I've noticed is that sometimes patients especially don't have the self-confidence to trust their own self-nurturing or self-healing instincts. How can a person grow those skills personally? You're 100% right. That is true of patients and doctors too. Yes. You know, uh, we have something in us known, which is called the nervous system. The autonomic nervous system actually runs on a deeper level than the conscious nervous system. And though some people are very, very sensitive to it. The autonomic nervous system is when we get a gut feeling. You ever got a gut feeling and you just say, I knew I should have done that, and I didn't, and I, I'm not, I knew it, I felt it in my guts, I felt it in my heart. I felt, well, that is actually the autonomic nervous system talking to the person. And some people just, it's a whisper. And, but some people it's much stronger. That can be developed. Your instincts, your guts, your feelings uh, are more than just old wives' tales or just you know, abstract uh, ideas. But there's a strong inner sense of knowing we all have. You know, I guess we use it when we pick our mates at times. Of course, some of us screw that up pretty good. But, <laughs> But we, so we have it, especially it's very close. Mothers and children have it. I've seen mothers that they'll just stop and say, something's wrong with my child. And the kid might be a thousand miles away. Yep. They, they feel it. We are connected. And with my work, which is now called KST, the initials for Corin Specific Technique, uh, we actually teach doctors and patients, anyone to learn, to get comfortable with that feeling and start trusting it. Because surprisingly, and we've done this now tens or hundreds of thousands of times collectively, it's accurate. It's yes. accurate so well. And I don't know if you've, in your experience, have met doctors that are very sensitive or intuitive or sort of just tune into their feelings? Uh, yes, although I think that uh, the Western medical environment kind of beats that out of you on a daily basis. So like I went back about 10 years ago and started actively growing my intuition. And, you know, I definitely do specific exercises to make sure I'm actively using my intuition every day. Oh, excellent. That is, that is wonderful. Um, to me, that is the true basis of all healing. And if we st I started studying this because it seems so different from what we're taught at school because it's totally intellectual and it cuts out your feelings. You know, uh, Larry Dossi, MD, wrote a book on, um, on medicine. Oh, he's wrote so many good ones. Um, and he talks about 
how medicine is destroying the soul of the practitioner. Yes. That's scary. Yes, yes. And I remember Bernie Siegel, the MD, the, the cancer surgeon, uh, he, would, he wrote about exceptional cancer patients and all. And in his books, and I've heard him lecture, he would discuss doctors that would be, he'd go walk through the hospital, he'd go down the stairwell instead of the elevator, and he'd see doctors crying because they felt so frustrated and unable to really be the healer they wanted to be because they had to follow certain directives that were totally intellectual and not where their heart or guts were telling them. So in my work we actually have exercises we do also teaching you how to tune into this ability. And we always tell all of our doctors and, and students, we say, just do this you'll discover on your own your sensitivity will increase. You don't have to work at it. You don't have to think about it. It's just going to happen. Awesome. You know, awesome. It's like when you work out, your muscles will get better no matter how you think. Whether you like it or not, you lift those weights, you're going to get bigger muscles. And it's the same thing. The more you practice tuning in and feeling and being tr honest with yourself, uh, the, the better you get at it. It's just going to happen that way. So I, I applaud you for, for doing that. I wish more professionals had your insights. Thank you. So let me ask you, if you had three quick tips that somebody could put into action today to feel better, get their body feeling better, what would some quick tips be? It doesn't have to be three, but three would be nice. Oh, boy, just three. Oh, my <laughs> God, what am I going to think of that? Um, only eat foods your grandparents say. <laughs> right, okay, we got that one. Avoid high fructose corn syrup. Well, that's nutritional. Uh, the Weston Price Foundation, W E S T O N Price. It's really Weston A Price Foundation deals with traditional foods. They've studied them and found that they are far, far healthier than modern foods. And they actually went to peak to Weston Price in the 20s and 30s was a dentist actually, the head of the American Dental Association Research Statist uh, Society. And he went around, he did research that nobody could ever do today. Him and his wife traveled in the 1920s and 30s throughout the world to isolated tribes. These tribes did not know cancer, heart disease, diabetes, or mental illness, or dental problems. They didn't even have dentists in their cultures. He went to over 700 villages. And not only were they like in Africa and Polynesia and Melanesia, well, you know, they were, in, they were off this coast of Scotland and Ireland and in uh, isolated mountain villages in Switzerland where they were incredibly healthy. And he found the same thing. When they stayed true to the traditional diet, they were healthier. So if you're Asian, don't drink milk for one thing because that's not an Asian thing and it'll probably be unhealthy for you. But uh, if you are if from northern, uh, um, northern Europe, then milk would be okay, butter would be okay, other cultures. Eat traditionally based on your culture. There's a wonderful book called Nourishing Traditions, which is really a cookbook. Are you aware of that? No, that you sounds know? great. Big yellow book, it's inexpensive, and it's my cookbook. But it has the first 40 or 50 pages are just nutrition ideas and tell you about fats and oils and carbs. So that's the first thing, which I, which I know that's a long answer to it. Uh, the other thing is to uh, follow your instincts and guts. So I've had so many patients over the years say, I don't think I should be taking this many drugs. And you say, yes, you're right, you shouldn't. Uh, have you read the labels? No. Uh, have you ever looked in a PDR? Have you seen the, the list of what the side effects are? No. Well, guess what? You're suffering from a lot of them. Um, how about, um, you know, and using intuition, my work, which is different from the typical medical work, uh, is we ask their bodies, should they be taking this drug, that drug, that drug, and the body will tell you. Yes. It's amazing. Their bodies, their arm, you can use muscle testing, their arms will go weak. We use a different method, which is fast, but it's both are biofeedback. I call them binary biofeedback devices. Okay. Binary because it's yes, no, biofeedback is you're picking up from their body or your body. Mm -hmm. It's the autonomic nervous system. So uh, another one is get out of polypharmacy if you really feel like uh, you, you're not comfortable with these drugs, go to your doctor. If your doctor thinks it's great, go to a different doctor. You know, find someone who is sensitive to the dangers of drugs. Yes. Medicine is now considered the, the number one cause of death in the United States. 
and a lot of it is pharmaceutical drugs taken properly. You know, so we're not talking about overdoses. Or, these are properly prescribed and properly taking medications. And uh, you know, the third one is, uh, oh my God, there's like a hundred different things. But uh, you know, it's not just eating it's stuff. It's not eating other things. And it's and go for a walk. Good relationships. That's the key. And that's that sounds so trite, though, doesn't it? So is that your personal secret for living your best every day? The relationships. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, without a sense of being connected, you really are not fully alive. Um, in fact, uh, you know, when we do, we talk about this gut feeling that that you work that you're personally working on, and I teach and all. This is really being connected. You know, you're really connecting to the patients. Is this any different from prayer? No, it's really not. Prayer works, and there are hundreds of studies showing how powerful yes. prayer is. Because, and is it the same mechanism? I suspect it is, but you know, there's varieties of it. There's a famous. There's so many things in the world that we don't understand, but they're there, but we can't see them. And it's the famous. Uh, actually, I just heard this quote: a famous Kabbalist. Kabbalist is ancient Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah. Uh, uh, Rabbi Gekalta, who said, there is no empty space between heaven and earth. Wow. He says there are battalions between in the other worlds, and they are either trying to lift us up or tear us down. But there's no empty space. And that's why when you pray, always pray with that understanding that it's not going to be easy. And when you work on patients, you always keep that in your mind. It's not going to be easy but you do it with your heart, with the right instincts and the right desire. So. And that's what really comes through speaking with you today is your heart and where you come from as a healer and what you have to offer the world through your experience and your, your technique you've developed and everything you bring to that relationship with, with the people who see you personally and the people who get to meet you virtually. And I am so grateful that you've agreed to, to talk with us today. I'm thrilled. I am so thrilled that when we met uh, a month or so ago, um, I really felt uh, I met someone who truly was an exceptional healer. And thank you for all the great stuff you're doing. Well, I, I, I'm in awe of you. <laughs> well, thank you. So that wraps up our podcast for today for Think and Grow Well. And we'll see you next time. Beware. Vitality is an inside job. Trust your spirit, make up your mind, and get your body in gear. There are no second chances. 